Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, today we are kicking off with the Unido Talks, uh, where we invite the leaders from uh, the crypto and blockchain industry to talk about various topics and most importantly, new ideas, their opinions, key insights, and uh, where the future of crypto industry and its subpart is heading to. So today we have uh, Aaron with us, uh, who is the Director of Social Impact at Jacobi Asset Management. And alongside, we have the Chief Commercial Officer and Co-Founder of Unido, Michael Swan. So, okay, let's start with a small introduction. Aaron, can you please give us a small introduction and your, how your journey in the crypto industry has been? Yeah, so I uh, had a, a 10 to 12 year experience in the NGO world in Asia, mostly um, in places like Afghanistan, uh, Nepal, East Timor, and Cambodia, um, many stops in between. And then I uh, ran away from that because I didn't feel like the NGO world had an effective culture and was lacking transparency. And, um, you know, among some other problems that many people know about, I uh, fell into the crypto asset space about five years ago because people kept coming to me asking for help with their wallets. I, I mean, I literally fell into it. So that was the biggest hurdle for people to, to actually figure out the tech around the wallets. And um, luckily the technology has become better, but there's still a lot of challenges for people who aren't tech savvy. Um, <clears throat> I then went from helping people manage their assets to uh, running a crypto algo fund out of Ireland. And then I realized I didn't want to manage a crypto algo fund and, and switched into placement into the best funds in the industry. So I got into a serious research and uh, due diligence mission that went on for about 10 months leading up to March of 2020. And um, yeah, I, I found some of the best funds and um, I have happy clients, which is great. And now I'm working with uh, Jacoby uh, for one of the world's first uh, Bitcoin spot ETFs. Oh yeah, and yeah, big congratulations for that. I, I, I read the news that you got the first uh, regulated Bitcoin ETF with your space, right? It's the first uh, uh, tier one uh, Bitcoin ETF in the world. Okay. Um, and there's there's a lot of differentiation in the ETF world, which people don't realize. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, tier, tier one is best. So. Okay, makes sense. All right. Yeah, okay. Uh, we can then uh, directly jump into questions. And uh, I see that you have worked uh, very uh, intimately with the with the asset management firms and, you know, building a, a network of, uh, let's say, investors. So what do you think, what are the crucial things which uh, the asset management firms are looking for uh, when they are going forward with uh, storing crypto assets or possibly utilizing custodian services? And are you, are you talking about uh, traditional firms or are you talking about uh, crypto firms? Uh, let, let's discuss both. Like, uh, if there is any difference or what these two firms are uh, looking for, yeah, we would like to know that as well. Okay. I mean, as far as traditional asset managers, they've been waiting for ETFs. This is why it's such a big deal. Um, and this is why you'll see, you know, in America, people are just waiting and begging for ETFs to be allowed because the institutions aren't really going to jump in until there are fully backed ETFs. I mean, people have gotten into, um, you know, ETNs and ETPs, which they're, uh, I'm sorry, a bunch of acronyms, but <laughs> they're, ex they're exchange traded products, um, but they can often be leveraged as debt instruments where um, uh, ETFs, um, exchange traded funds are fully regulated and they can't be leveraged. Um, as debt instruments. So that's that's as fully backed as it gets. And yeah, it's going to allow for the institutional development. So that's, that's what traditional um, asset managers are looking for. Um, and uh, honestly, some asset managers still don't know the difference. Um, 
between the subtleties and, and have gotten their uh, clients into ETNs. So um, as far as uh, crypto asset managers, um, that's, that's, a, that's a different conversation just because you know, people who are in the crypto space are, are way more comfortable with crypto. And you have a lot of people who were never in the traditional space who are now the CEOs of these asset management firms and, and funds. Um, I would say uh, from the crypto side of things, because I've, I've been in this space since the beginning of, of crypto funds, especially, um, you know, people are looking for and will continue to move into uh, third party custody solutions that are uh, insured or have extra layers of security like uh there's copper out of london which i think is one of the best um third-party custody solutions for crypto but it's it's uh got multi-signature uh, functions um they uh use zero knowledge proof they use uh sharding of uh of you know bitcoin uh sorry uh, just crypto access in general with keys and um, yeah, it's it's one of the safest bets in the industry to go with a firm like that. All right, makes sense. Uh, Michael, uh, this will be my next question for you. So uh, generally we are seeing this heated debate, especially in the custody industry, uh, logged custody or self custody, right? And uh, we are seeing the shift uh, as in, uh, the decentralized space is getting more traction and it is gaining more popularity, we are seeing the, the self-custodial side of things getting more dominant. So uh, what do you think will be better for, let's say, enterprises or asset managers or institutions? And uh, what are the things they should be looking for when they are choosing either of the two? So the, there are various different iterations of how to hold assets. And Aaron touched on it when it was specific to asset managers, traditional and crypto managers. It comes down to firstly, recognizing the demand, what she highlighted was um, either version want exposure to Bitcoin, it's now how you hold it. So ETF is essentially wrapping Bitcoin in, a, in an equity wrapper. And that's because the funds are set up to hold tradable equity um, instruments. So if you look through uh, from funds through to corporates, they still face the exact same problem. It, it just may not be as acute. It's how do you hold these assets? Because of course, crypto originally was an enthusiast exercise. An individual can, can enter it if they're comfortable with the arrangements with a corporation. You have controls, you have board of directors, you have security procedures. Asset managers have investment committees and, and, and vote on transacting very similar to a board, um, depending on what the rules are for the fund. So it comes down to the rules in which an organisation, corporate or asset manager, is allowed to hold material assets. And this continues to change. Like Aaron said, uh, there are good asset man uh, there are good custodians, legal custodians out there. Uh, the difficulty is, of course, that's a third party holding your assets. And as we know, there are break-ins, there are fraudulent businesses, assets go missing. And unfortunately, in crypto land, um, there's zero return rate unless the, the hacker or, or the person responsible volunteers the assets back. So uh, it's good because you can a, a custodian, you can entrust they're set up, they have the security arrangements, they've got the experience for holding these assets. They work within uh, regulatory frameworks for where these corporations live so that it matches their needs from a corporate governance perspective. It is expensive and there's the downsides we've talked about. Then you look at, at, at self-custody. So holding the assets directly really comes down to a technical exercise of if you if you accept you, you take title of the assets because you own them and you control them by virtue of holding the private key, which is typically the measure, the control of the asset at the end of the day in most jurisdictions. Well, how do you control that private key? So to date, if you leave service providers alone for a moment and you're gonna take control of that key yourself, 
uh, your, your options are limited. Is a corporation going to be comfortable with a thumb drive sitting in a desk of someone, you know, in treasuries uh, or a pocket? No, of course not. Um, you know, you look at Tesla for an example, I'm sure Elon Musk would love to have that thumb drive for the Bitcoin on a chain around his neck. But the, the directors aren't going to allow it. The constitution where uh, the companies are based off and how they're run won't allow those sorts of things. There's very specific rules. So what you need in a self-custody arrangement is something that is secure and something that doesn't allow um, any interference between the blockchain, the, the technology of trading the asset, and the authorization given. So you get down to uh, software-driven systems typically because they're efficient compared to hardware. There's, there's less failure concerns. There's less physical theft concerns. And Aaron touched on it. Uh, COP is a great example because they, they have all the various security instruments, the fragmented key, uh, signing the um, multi-party signature from a corporate governance perspective so not one person can move the assets. This is what's important with corporations and frankly for asset managers to have proper corporate governance around their assets. Uh, you can't take in that in asset manager world, you can't take people's money uh, without, you can't get a financial services license to be an asset manager without uh, procedures around control of assets, for instance. Now, often you defer those to the custodian. Sometimes they do self custody. Sometimes the prime broker holds the assets for you but there are procedures in place for moving assets. So if you talk about self-custody, you need a system which can match your procedures and not force a corporation to change their procedure to suit the software. Uh, if we're talking about crypto going mainstream and getting picked up for widespread use in treasury and corporations and asset managers taking exposure, um, the systems in place need to match what the organizations are doing to date, telling them to fundamentally change their, their sign-off processes and their controls uh, is going to bring uh, adoption to a halt. So what we need are solutions which match how a, a firm may control its, its um, bank accounts, for instance, usually multi-sig of directors transacting to move assets. Crypto should be the same. If we've got software packages, such as Unidu EP, for instance, um, these need to slot in and allow the corporation, the organization, the hedge fund, whatever it, uh, organization it is, to continue to operate as it would with any other asset class. That's the key to adoption here. If we try to force them down a different route, it, it, it will be piecemeal. People um, won't take it up as quickly. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, please go ahead, yeah, Aaron. I was just going to say, well said. Um, I appreciate that. Um, another thing that I'm seeing um, uh, around assets and, and more so with the AUM is that in Europe, for example, um, I'm working with a, an alternative fund that's a crypto fund, but they can only legally operate as an alternative fund and they have a uh, hundred million euro maximum for assets under management set out by the the rules of the government the problem they're running into right now and this is where we need regulators to open up and you know central banks is that uh they're doing everything um as far as custody with uh, a third party um they're they're acting as if they're a traditional investment firm and they can't go above 100 million in assets under management until they have a, a treasury uh, for the funds. But the problem is the treasuries don't want to touch it because it's crypto related. <laughs> so, so there's there's also this this place that we're getting to where obviously we've gone into into uh, you know mass acceptance of, of cryptocurrency that, that that's here <laughs> but um we need the governments and regulators to be understanding now and, and to let these uh crypto funds that are doing everything by the book to, to really become um you know fully operational as as uh, traditional funds can it's an interesting yeah. point the regulation gap right there's uh regulation has stepped up in various jurisdictions as it relates to individuals and people actually owning assets. 
And I think it, it trails behind in the actual financial services and especially the asset management section because the rules to date have been so specific around constructs that work for fiat world and it hasn't really taken into consideration crypto. So I think it's a very, very fair point unless you want to incorporate in the minnows um, which have sandboxes for these things. If we want to go mainstream and, you know, you have Singapore funds that are registered with the MAS or the SEC in the US or APRA, um, FINRA, uh, FINRA, I believe, um, they need to start contemplating these because there's clearly demand for these products. We, we, everyone you talk to wants access. Some want to have access direct. Others want fund access or they want their pension account to have some level of crypto exposure. So the demand is there and hopefully the demand will push through um, the regulators to start giving very clear guidelines and considerations for the asset class as it relates to asset funds because Aaron's entirely right um, you know, there's plenty of uh, advanced jurisdictions which have very sophisticated frameworks for other asset classes. We're talking about the fastest growing asset class now. Uh, the regulators need to catch up in, in relation to financial services around this, not just trading, not just exchanges, but actual licensing of intermediaries, licensing of asset managers and how you hold these things. So there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah, and the yeah, thing is absolutely. too, there is there is a, sorry, I have a lot to say on this. Please, please there work. there is there is an impact on on society and jobs with this. So what you have now with these funds that are maxed out is that they're now they don't know what to do and or they're getting close to being maxed out. So they're looking at setting up in other countries uh, with with new structures and going offshore. And you know that's that's moving money away from the country, and it's also moving jobs away from the country. Yeah, it's a globalization matter, absolutely. The minnows are doing well because they're they're mm. quick and nimble to quickly get a law firm to write up their their regulations. And the larger the larger you know first world countries, which typically hold um, most of the power in in these sorts of um, asset manager spaces, you know how how strong Canada is, for instance. In, in its pension funds. Um, if, if they don't move, they will find people go offshore through necessity and you lose your competitive your competitive advantage over the other countries. Um, crypto in of itself is globalization and level setting at the end of the day, that's the whole point of it. So mm -hmm. um, you will find these sort of, I, I, I don't mean any disrespect by it, but they're smaller countries, which are often, often set up for uh, financial services. Uh, they're finding this very lucrative for the licensing of these sorts of funds and, and the mm -hmm. established powerhouses uh, will get left behind if they don't keep up. So there's, the demand is here. The infrastructure around holding these things and actually making them pliable for asset managers, for corporations uh, to work with is, is uh, here, but there's still development to come. The regulation is tailing. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I see this thing in, in a country like in, I mean, we are seeing like millions of people investing in cryptos, the retail investors. Uh, there are reports that around uh, 10, like six to seven, eight billion dollars worth of funds have been invested by Indians in crypto. But the uh, institutional investors, the asset managers, they can't just do anything because retail investors are able to invest in the absence of regulations. But uh, institutions or asset managers, they don't know what to do because they have to comply with a separate set of uh, rules or regulations, which will be potentially set up possibly from the month of February against speculations. So yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, regulations have been one of the key uh, point of discussions, which will be leading to the adoption of cryptos among asset managers. Uh, Erin, this will be my question to you. What do you think are the other challenges which uh, possibly these traditional family houses, uh, wealth management firms, financial planners, asset management firms, they are facing uh, when it comes to possible, possibly uh, adopting cryptocurrencies or getting access to DeFi, uh, crypto-related products, crypto investments, etc.? Well, I mean, 
uh, family offices and asset managers have different uh, rules. And I would say asset managers have more rules. So I guess I'm not so concerned that family offices can't get access to what they want. Um, but it's with traditional asset managers, you know, um, they, they, they have to be uh, regulated products or, you know, as in the ETNs, uh, close to it. <laughs> um, but I guess it's, you know, being able to keep up with the demand for different assets that are crypto assets that are actually regulated um, because we're in early stages. It's like, you know, we pretty much just have Bitcoin ETFs. I mean, soon you'll start to see Ethereum ETFs and, you know, many of the other bigger uh, coins. Um, I guess uh, I'm, I'm trying to think like, other than that, you know, when we're talking about DeFi, um, DeFi is a little bit tricky. I mean, you could probably have, you will probably see um, DeFi uh, ETFs in the future, but right now, like asset managers can't really get into DeFi um, with uh, decentralized wallets, for example, because it's, you know, it's kind of hard to do the KYC around that. So um, any any product that doesn't involve proper KYC AML, they can't really get involved with. Okay, so yeah, I get this. Uh, so any kind of uh, investment, uh, which the asset managers are willing to do, they need to have a proper uh, uh, compliance with respect to KYC and AML uh, restrictions or regulations, right? Is it that? But other than that, uh, do you feel on the, let's say on the, on the technology part, infrastructure part, or uh, let's say mm, the volatility of crypto assets or anything, is there, is there anything which these, uh, which the traditional investors are finding challenging uh, with respect to cryptocurrency space or they are open to it? Because I see that you have been talking to the asset managers quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the problems I've seen in, in my day to day with traditional asset managers is that uh, if they're not in the industry, understanding the nuances and the players, um, I think it's harder for them to make more informed decisions. So for example, um, you know, I know a traditional asset manager who got his client um, into uh, Grayscale uh, for, for Bitcoin. And Grayscale doesn't have an ETF, but he just assumed because it's Grayscale and that's like the go-to name now in the media that it, it was an ETF and that it's fully regulated, but it's not. Um, Grayscale is a trust and you're pretty much buying into the trust. You're not buying into an exchange traded product. So I, I think just, you know, traditional um, managers are so wrapped up in their worlds that, you know, they kind of tend to go to what's being talked about in the media, what other firms are doing, but I don't think that I could fully rely on the due diligence. Mm -hmm. So do you think that there is a, uh, I won't say comparatively more, but still sufficient demand for exchange traded products compared to the Bitcoins, like the, the original Bitcoins. I didn't hear that last part. So, so do you think that there is a, there is a comparatively, there is a sufficient demand for exchange traded product more and uh, asset managers are finding the exchange traded products more attractive or possibly uh, more easy to invest when it comes to, uh, I mean, for example, they have to comply with uh, with the regulations and everything. So these exchange traded products are helping them more. Yeah, and, and they don't have to worry about wallets. <laughs> ah, that makes sense. Because there's two different That's investor it, yeah. bases, right? At the end of yeah. the day, if you talk about demand, um, if you buy into an ETF, you do it because you need 
someone to manage the investment or you need mm. the format of it being equity and you typically pay a premium for that. I think I can't remember what the premium grayscale, uh, grayscale trades at today versus Bitcoin, but it, it is m- meaningful. So you're only taking an ETF wrapped product to get underlying exposure if that is the format that you can consume, put simply. Otherwise, mm. you obviously take something with no wrapping costs. So there clearly is the success of Grayscale um, uh, highlights that there is demand and these people would buy Bitcoin directly if they could. So mm-hmm. I, I think you think of them as two different investor bases that have two different appetites. They want the same risk, but they don't want to, they don't want to invest in the same thing because they can't or they're scared or whatever the reason is. And I, I think mm-hmm. Grayscale is a great example. So as you see, um, you know, the, the property one uh, exchanges, uh, sorry, ETFs like what Aaron is launching, come to market, I, I think there'll be substantial demand for these things because it all comes back to the regulations around these funds. They're not, the vast majority of them, especially in the in the first world countries, aren't set up to buy Bitcoin directly. They'd love to. If you look at the pension fund annual general meetings in Australia, for instance, every single one of the major one of them had questions from members, uh, members about Uh, this year about what is their crypto strategy? How are they going to introduce crypto exposure? The demand's definitely there, right? This second, those pension funds can hold them directly in Australia under the regulations. So ETFs Mm -hmm. are a real access point. So I I mean, um, I I know the question was directed to Aaron, but a personal view is um, demand is not going to be an issue. It's just broadening the pie. It's not that you're fitting two products into the same pie. You're adding investors who couldn't access the first pie. And oh, I guess the, you know, the ETFs need to buy the BTC from the free market. So um, mm-hmm. I won't give price guidance, but you know what happens when there's a large amount of buy side demand. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, and I wanted to add, like, you know, other than, you know, it's crypto is going splitting into the people who have wallets and, and the people who don't. And that's where the ETFs come in. So it's the wallet list. But, um, Another good thing about ETFs for institutions and uh, professional investors is that um, the prices are actually in real time and can be traded instantly on the exchanges. So, you know, that's that's a really nice bonus. Yeah, absolutely. So you get the exposure to the same asset without holding the asset. That's that's the plus I think these asset managers are looking for. And, and the first question, yeah, Nick, I mean, yeah. sorry, go on, Aaron. Please, please. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to say it, it also eliminates the issues, of course, of like holding your assets online and worrying about mm-hmm. an exchange getting hacked. That's true. Yeah, yeah my, my, um, my follow on point was around technology and your question, Vic, around broader DeFi and interactions such as yield vaults and everything. Um, everyone in the industry, you know, is reasonably comfortable with Web3, you know, wallet interactions with a website to, you know, state coins or to enter into liquidity mining. Um, Let's face it, folks that aren't used to how to submit transactions and what happens if you don't put enough gas on MetaMask and where does you, what happens to your transaction? These are real stepping stones for folks to participate in in pledging to smart contracts. It's not a straightforward exercise, especially if you're not used to these things, assets can be lost. So there's a technical element that that holds back traditional asset managers and, and even maybe family offices. If they're not from the industry and they haven't got the experience, they might want the demand and they don't really care about or they're not limited by compliance reasons. It's just practical access. Uh, some, some yield vaults are easier to use than others. Some are, are quite difficult, especially on the front end. Some require multiple transactions out of your MetaMask wallet. You know, um, there's various reasons why MetaMask transactions, especially on Ethereum, might fall over with where the um, the congestion is. What to do? Mm-hmm. How to nullify the last transaction? But that's a technical knowledge. Uh, an asset manager who has a transaction with money lost, you know, the transaction continuously pending, for instance, um, that that's a big risk to be entering into those activities when they don't know what to do. So what do you do? Yeah. Hire a, a blockchain specialist team, maybe. Mm. Hire technologists or have platform and technology which removes these issues. It's one or the other, because you're not going to do it if you don't know, especially if you're managing other people's money. Yeah, I think uh, this comes as a part of adoption. Like if you're seeing a new uh, asset adopting, which is working on a relatively newer technology, 
I think the asset managers have to also sometimes in the future have to also adopt to these technologies and the uh, and to, and its infrastructure if they want to access it and most importantly if they want to securely access it. So yeah, blockchain specialist, uh, possibly some uh, experienced cybersecurity personals will be uh, taking the space, and uh, that's how you know that's how where fintech kicks in, like fin finance and tech. It comes together. Yeah, and that's the, where the industry is still quite immature, right? At the end of the yeah, day, yeah. it's been around yeah. a bit over a decade. Um, yeah. And people, you know, look to the Bitcoin price, you know, started trading at point something of a cent, and you know, mm -hmm. here we are a bit north of sixty thousand. Um, but the the industry and crypto, it is immature still. We are still in the early mm -hmm. stages, and these things will evolve. But to get mm -hmm. To get um, momentum and get acceptance now, you can't say, well, we'll get there in 10 years. We, we need the industry and the developers to be, um, to show, you know, innovation and ingenuity right now. And that's what will, will escalate adoption at the end of the day. We need regulators to catch up, but we need the technology to work. You know, banking is simple. Fiat banking is quite straightforward. We need crypto to be as simple. And then there's no doubt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Uh, I think uh, in the in the beginning of the conversation, uh, I think Aaron also touched uh, some base on let's say MPC and uh, multi signature wallets, and uh, we we are seeking the seeing this uh, growing demand. I mean, uh, not from the asset managers, but we are seeing these upcoming enterprise platforms who are building uh, possibly gateways for these asset managers. They are very much coming up with. MPCs, multi-signature, creek fragmentation with Unido, for example. So, Michael, this will be my question to you. And you also you also talked about uh, the corporate governance flows and uh, the multiple, let's say, transaction signing, which uh, needs to happen, which these asset managers need uh, inside their business models. So, can you can you give us uh, some insights or possibly explain uh, like what these technologies are and uh, uh, how are asset managers benefiting from these technologies? So with multi-party computation of keys, it's splitting the key up, hand it amongst several people and reconstituting it uh, when those people agree to send their fragments in. So it's a very simple way of uh, bifurcating authority amongst, well, multiple people, I suppose, uh, which when you're in the corporate arena or the asset management uh, arena, that's necessary because uh, you need multiple points uh, of control over asset movement, especially when it's crypto and there's very little chance, there's, there's no recourse legally to retain these things other than you catch the person. So you need a security solution which uh, takes into account corporate governance. So the organization that owns the asset can be certain that there's multiple people making the decision to make these assets move. And then you need a, a, a conduit to make the assets move. Now, in a uh, fiat world, for instance, you might have a prime broker or a custodian, but they are a legal entity. They have their own procedures to ensure the right people signed, um, that they're not getting spoof emails from someone else claiming to be their client. They have procedures and processes and infrastructure to ensure this. In crypto, uh, there isn't an organization called Ethereum which checks these things when you send a transaction. It's, it's a blockchain. There's no responsibility there. It is known how it operates and it's reliable because it's software, but at the end of the day, there isn't a responsibility on that end. So the organization really needs to ensure that they take responsibility, that their orders make it to the blockchain. They're not circumvented. Um, so how do you do that? So MPC is a great model because the private key is attached to the asset and you cannot move the asset without private key. So if you split the private key up and give it to certain fragments of it to certain people that have authority to operate, it's the perfect model, right? You don't rely on someone else. Um, it's not like you sign off on a website and the websites are vulnerable and at the end of the day, the, the private key is in a database somewhere. Uh, one person gets hacked, they only win part of the key. It solves a security issue, but it also allows the corporate governance requirements to be met 
and the outcome of the voting affects the transaction directly at the blockchain level. It's not augmented into a server, then the instructions go off and there's multiple points of failure there. You can intercept. It's, it's getting as close to the blockchain as you can as an organization rather than an individual with a web wallet, of course. So that's why MPC is, is key. There's lots of big players. Well, sorry, um, there is a big player. We, we all know Fireblocks. They've got a fantastic billion dollar EV and that's because this, this uh, technology is so critical to solve the corporate governance and the security issues that corporates need. And I say corporates, I mean asset managers, I mean uh, companies, I mean any, any sophisticated organisation that has rules about it, how they transact. And it's not even just sophisticated organisations. You could take into small partnerships where the, uh, the you know, a legal practice, medical practice that holds or accepts uh, crypto for payment, uh, the, the partners decide on how the assets move. That's not necessarily a sophisticated organisation, but do these people care any less about other people stealing their money? Of course not. It's the exact same implication to them on a smaller scale. So the, the need... And the solution being MPC is, is universally needed for anyone that jointly owns a wallet or assets that sit on a wallet, if you boil this down. This is why it's so critical to sort out a, a security measure where it can't be uh, circumvented. It's not with an exchange in a jurisdiction which, frankly, the regulations are light, shall we say, or con legal consequences aren't really pursuable. Uh, then yeah. you'll hold it yourself. So then you need a solution that puts you next to the blockchain, gives you the security, and it matches your needs uh, for authority. MPC, uh, in my opinion, and it sounds based off what I've heard from Erin, especially at the start of the call, uh, MPC is the, is the easy and obvious solution here. All right. Okay. So I see that, uh, and I think in the past, like you have worked with Goldman Sachs, uh, uh, we are seeing that with this new technology, with blockchain, we are kind of, uh, again, trying to remove the middleman, is it? And uh, if we are doing it, I think these are these services possibly going to be very cost effective. Uh, well, that's, that's because, the point, right? Um, in all, a third party provider has costs. It's a presumably yeah. a for-profit organization. So there's a profit requirement, there's operations requirements. These are humans that are involved and software and hardware and usually a combination of them. So they cost money, then you have individuals and when you have humans involved, that adds risks through error or through malfeasance. So if you remove these things and you can in-house into a reliable format, MPC being one of them, the risk really sits with the people who have that signing authority but you live with that day to day in any solution that you employ, whether you're holding stocks with a prime brokerage or a crypto via a custodian, they could still collude to multi-sign any other technology. The risk that will always be apparent with the final sign off, regardless of the, the format of asset or how they're protected. Um, but uh, removing middle, as you said, the middlemen that provide a solution it obviously removes the cost. With MPC, if it's deployed properly, you can have a solution which works and protects all those things that are important. And if it's a bulletproof software solution, uh, then, then you would not expose yourself to further risks or even potentially less risks. Wonderful. All right, that sounds great. Erin, uh, uh, this is my question to you. So like, what does your, uh, let's say, network of asset managers uh, look like for example as michael explained so there has to be an asset manager then there has to be a custodian who are holding assets possibly prime brokerages and then uh, asset managers for example jacobi asset manager or management are willing to sell bitcoin etfs so i, I just want to understand like uh, uh, the current asset management firms what their network what their infrastructure and what their what their entire model looks like and uh, how it is helping the investors? Well, I mean, uh, with Jacoby, we we have the, I guess the, the front office, you'd say, where where the business side is under one structure, and then there's the actual fund manager um, for for the 
the assets and the onboarding of the funds. But, um, you know, we're also backed by Fidelity, which is great. So we, we have that custody solution, which is probably the best in the world. <laughs> um, but um, to the, the latter part of your conversation, I'm ser sorry, your question, what was that? How it, yeah, so you, you I was just, something about these factors? Yeah, yeah, so I was just trying to understand. Uh, so for example, you have these custodies, uh, let's say Fidelity, and uh, you have this network of investors. So how is Jacobi playing a role in connecting, uh, con like what are the services that they can from Fidelity then probably uh, creating something on their own space and offering to investors. Well, we're really the the there's the the business side, which is the the part that I'm in, um, where we've we've put the thing together. <laughs> we've you know we set up all the contracts. Um, we do the marketing that you know we're the marketing side. Um, but then you know there's the the fund management, um, and then which is actually regulated to, to deal with the funds. And then, um, you know, once the, uh, once the uh, ETF is live on the market, it's because it's not live yet, we were just approved. Um, then, it's, then it's, you know, on the exchanges and it's, it's up to the uh, asset managers to buy into it on the exchanges. So there's a number right, of moving yeah. parts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, it's very well inter interconnected. Right. Okay, uh, uh, I will come down to my um, two of the last questions. So we were like uh, talking about uh, uh, regulatory bodies and friendly, uh, friendly regulations. And uh, let's discuss the two parts of the globe. One is Europe, where you are from, Erin, and the other part is Australia. So, mm, like we, we said that there are friendly regulations needed. Uh, from your perspective, what can be these friendly regulations? Or I, sh I would say that what will be your advice to create, let's say this type of regulation for the asset manager so that they can flourish with the crypto assets? Uh, from my perspective, uh, friendly regulations are uh, created with education and uh, speaking with the people who actually birthed the industry. I think the biggest problem with anything in this matter is that you have lawmakers who uh, don't have a lot of time. And, you know, I'm thinking in particular about America. That's where I'm from. And I'm happy I don't work there because I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing. <laughs> Um, but uh, even as far as ETFs, because they're, you know, spot ETFs are not legal in America yet. But yeah, it, it takes policymakers really uh, working with people in the industry in, instead of just uh, quickly making uh, regulations and packaging them into uh, bigger, bigger bills. Like that's, that's a big issue in America, for example, right now is, you know, there's a big bill put together a couple months ago that's... Um, going to go to the house pretty soon but it in the bill they said oh uh that uh um developers who work on blockchain should have brokerage licenses that makes no sense whatsoever <laughs> because you can work on the blockchain without holding client assets or managing them it, it makes no sense so yeah so i i uh from the European side of things where I'm based now, I definitely see more of an effort to, to work with industry leaders. Um, and uh, yeah, there just needs to be more uh, bridges made in that respect. Yeah, so I see like a, like a core advisor committee which can directly advise the government uh, when they are building crypto regulations, is it? And these, this core advisor committee consist of possibly the, the pioneers of, of the crypto industry uh, from, the, from the European continent, let's say. Yeah, I mean, it, it takes uh, policy making groups and, and lobbyist groups, but you know, we also have uh, issues with the uh, politicians who are bought out by uh, traditional 
paradigms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, mm. that's, that's another challenge. Okay. That, that is a big challenge. Yeah, Michael, uh, over to you. What would, would you feel would be the a kind of a friendly regulation in Australia which can help cryptos flourish? Oh, look, it's similar sentiment to what Aaron covered. You've, you've got um, regulators which have been regulating fiat for some time now and just trying to adapt similar frameworks to crypto by defining what crypto is then then um, mm -hmm. copy and pasting how the regulations apply to assets or securities, for instance, doesn't really work because the paradigm of how decentralized finance works, it's not um, peer to peer necessarily. They're, these are autonomous contracts. So the, the issue, you know, one of the biggest issues is KYC. You know, what do you do with the uni swaps of this world where you're trading into a blind pool and you have no idea who you're trading with? It's a difficulty. If you, if you ask a regulator, how do you look at it? Their simple attitude is, well, if you don't know your other person you're transacting, you shouldn't be doing it. So that wipes out the, the DEX scenarios that haven't, I know there's some coming in the pipeline that have things like KYC and FTs attached to participants and things like that. And I suppose that's how you will address it. Um, getting the regulators to understand the technology and the fixes for this is very difficult. So you get to steering groups in Australia, Blockchain Australia engages with the government. The government has been listening. Uh, there was a, a committee report that only went out a week or two ago regarding how to move forward. So there are early steps. My only criticism is we're getting to this committee report now, not four years ago. Um, but it is the right attitude in engaging with the industry and industry, I mean, developers, the brokerage houses, the guys who actually launch these tokens, the incubators, uh, because it's multifaceted. So trying to do this and try to remap the fiat world to a new type of security called utility token ignores the actual constructs of how these things are traded, how they're originated to begin with. You know, we do white papers. We don't do 144A disclosure documents. Um, the, the, the whole industry operates very differently. So trying to force it into fiat world isn't going to get you anywhere. You need to really start from, the script, from scratch. You can have similar principles as fiat, but the way these, uh, the way crypto works and the nature of a lot of these systems being autonomous and not legal entities and they're programmed a certain way, uh, uh, the regulations need to accept that because, um, it, it, you know, the voting on Ethereum changes is global. It's not going to listen to what um, this ASIC in Australia want to do. Uh, so we can adapt to the, the globalised uh, globalization, if you like, of, of, of finance being crypto, or we can say these things don't work, don't get involved, and all you do is leave Australia behind. So I think it's important what they're doing um, communicating with uh, Blockchain Australia and the, and the constituents of, of the membership to understand how the rules should work based on the premises of how things trade today. So that's the really important bit. Now, I mean, look, it largely um, mirrors what Aaron said. We, we need to get realistic with folks in crypto today of how this works, opposed to this is how crypto should work. Because like the US is a backwater for crypto currently, let's face it, private rounds aren't placed to US citizens because it's a litigation risk in the future if the SEC ever deems it to be a security. Um, they're getting left behind, frankly. Uh, and. Europe doesn't care, it's great because the project's coming out of Europe or, or central US, you know, the Cayman Islands, BVI uh, are powering ahead. So the, the same approach needs to be taken in the US, frankly. I hope Australia gets it right and I hope we do it from a bottom-up approach of understanding how the industry works because you're not going to change the industry in Australia. If we say Ethereum shouldn't work that way, let's have it changed you know, Not at all. That's, yeah, that's ridiculous. So you need yeah, to accept yeah. it's a global um, phenomenon. Phenomenon, yeah. It's, it's autonomous and the people who vote on changes aren't necessarily, uh, well, they're not definitely not lawmakers. They're not even necessarily large, sophisticated corporations. They're people who hold tokens. They're, um, you know, people who were 20-year-old developers 10 years ago. It's uh, mm -hmm. who have certain views or um, expectations of how they'd like to see the industry brought out. So it's pointless trying to jam the old regime on top and just call crypto a new instrument. 
Start from the beginning, build up around the constructs that exist in crypto globally today mm. and get to a point where it is acceptable by the regulator, you know, the KYC solutions, all that sort of stuff. But start from the bottom up. Don't, don't, let's not use the old wheel and try and jam it on top of crypto. It's not going to work. Yeah, and absolutely that's where the, again, the core committee, which is full of crypto pioneers, is also needed to first, let's, what Erin said, to educate these lawmakers. Yeah what crypto is starting from how the Ethereum blockchain or the decentralized protocols are working. And then you will be able to make the laws on top of it after understanding yeah, what is happening. Up, the understand how the technology up, works, how the industry works, not say how the industry should work. There's yeah. one, all you do is become a backwater when you won't work with how these protocols are designed to work. Absolutely. Half of them can't be Absolutely. changed to a degree that a regulator would want anyway. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, uh, it will be my last question to you both. It's, it's an abstract question, but uh, this is something which uh, especially the crypto community uh, wants to hear from the experts uh, of crypto and blockchain. Uh, so Erin, possibly like you said, you entered the crypto space after working in the NGOs. There must be something which brought you in the crypto space and then you educated yourself, uh, you learned and uh, now you are one of the most like influential voices. People want to hear you. What is your vision, uh, let's say, of the entire cryptocurrency market globally? And uh, uh, if there are ways to achieve it, how? Mm. I mean, my vision of the, the global market in the future is that everyone has easy access um as far as technologically speaking um you know i was just in africa for a little bit uh researching the emerging markets between uh kenya and uganda and uh you know a lot of people still have second generation phones and don't have smartphones <laughs> so there are these um what seem like you know nothing as, as far as hurdles they're actually pretty big hurdles so, um, you know, making sure that everyone has access and um, that, you know, crypto is a safer investment that's, that's fully backed in the future. Because, you know, I'm sitting here talking to you about ETFs, but that's for people who can invest at 100K and more. What about the rest of the population? <laughs> so you know, um, allowing um, ETFs uh, to be, uh, you know, easier to buy into, perhaps uh, tokenized um, and allowed for retail is super important because in the meantime, you have the rest of the world that can't enter into them now that are buying into products that just aren't as safe. <laughs> So yeah, that's that's what I would like to see in the future. Okay, so first of all, banking everyone, and second is possibly decentralizing uh, the institutions as well, right? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's necessarily banking everyone though. Mm -hmm. It's just giving it's access. access to crypto. Yeah, I think oh, okay. that term, now that I was in Africa, seeing this stuff in, in the real life on the ground, um, yeah we don't necessarily need banks per se. Mm -hmm. I guess we need social banking, peer-to-peer -peer banking. Peer -to -peer yes. Banking. Yes. Yes. Um, and, you know, just so you know, there's a, there's a, uh, this term in Kenya, the Chamas. Chamas are uh, women's savings groups and they're mm. a, a concept that is uh, very old. It's, it's nothing new to them. And they're, um, they gather every weekend and they sit under the tree in the village wow. and they stake their savings. Um, it's it's uh, the DeFi that existed before the technology. <laughs> so so these, these women don't necessarily, there are 40 million of them in East Africa and 80 million of them in the world. And they don't necessarily need banks. They just need the technology to do what they've already been doing for generations and some of mm -hmm. those women's savings groups are worth millions believe it or not <laughs> wow that's amazing if they have access to crypto related products and uh, if they're able to stake for example 
like literally stake their funds, they will have a source of passive income as well, which I think uh, the countries like Kenya, Uganda, you mentioned, they, they definitely need. They need passive sources. They need more and more sources of income. And uh, definitely first generational smartphones and internet can provide them. Crypto can provide them. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, Michael, uh, over to you. Uh, look, again, similar sentiment, um, universal access. Uh, Aaron talked about um, from different geographies and the needs as you, as you go into underdeveloped countries because, frankly, they aren't banked, uh, which I wholeheartedly agree with. Um, it was quite interesting. I was in Vietnam just before lockdown from COVID, uh, and, and that is a, you know, a, a second world economy. And uh, I paid for dinner in, in Bitcoin. It, it's quite interesting that some uh, some um, countries are ahead, even informally ahead with those things. So I think it can certainly work. There's infrastructure hurdles that, and when I say infrastructure, like I said, having phones. Um, first world, I, I think the um, the key is universal acceptance. So when you pay with a MasterCard or Visa card at a point of sale, should you be able to tap your phone and it debits? You know, it's just as easy and there aren't punitive costs for crypto versus, uh, you know, credit card, for instance. These are the things that really lead to mass adoption. Um, when you think of the, the efficiencies of blockchain and settling these things and people are having control of their own assets, for instance, and being able to spend them the same as cash, a real bottleneck is the on-off ramps, where at the end of the day, you're dealing with a dealing desk and you're at the whim of if that dealing desk will sell or buy to you, the prices they will quote you. It's all very intermediary based. Uh, once we get to a point where these things are widely accepted and everyone has a crypto wallet and you might pay for rent in cash, you might pay it in crypto and you can choose. That's where I'd like to see us get to, that they are, that they are, um, Fiat is is um, the brother and sister of crypto and vice versa, that they're interchangeable. And it's not that essentially crypto relies on fiat, right? Bitcoin at the end of the day is pegged to US dollars. Your ability to get Bitcoin out and get green back in your pocket is will a, prin a principal dealing desk sell? Now, yeah, it's a liquid market, um, but you are relying on fiat folks taking a position in Bitcoin. So it's not mm. really on par. I'd love to see it to get to par where, um, and I, I guess that this is really just, it needs to go mainstream or further mainstream, that it's universal acceptance. So it's not someone's willingness to take a risk in US dollars to buy Bitcoin. Maybe it's the reverse. <laughs> take oh. a risk in US dollars to give away your Bitcoin. The, um, the psychology isn't quite there yet uh, for mainstream, but that's where we need to get to eventually, I think. Absolutely. Uh, I think yeah, uh, this calls for another topic of discussion, which I think we can uh, discuss it the next time. The CBDCs. Mm. Uh, yeah, Th that's a whole another topic of discussion. And I think we can have it some other time because we, are, we have already uh, touched the one hour mark. Uh, yeah, I think it was a great discussion. And uh, thank you, Erin, for joining us. It was really great having you and having your insights on all the different topics. Uh, possibly if we have a discussion on CBDCs, I would love to invite you again. But uh, for time, uh, uh, yes, uh, I think we, we, we had a pretty informative and educative discussion, which the crypto community would love to hear. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, great. Thank insight. you, Vikram. Well, it's nice yeah. to meet you both. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, All right.